Welcome back, everybody. <coughs> Brenda Clues is a multimedia poet, artist, and video poet who's a... Let me start again. Brenda Clues is a multimedia poet, artist, and video poet whose approach broaches poetry, painting, theory, dance, recordings, and video. Poem fragments are written into paintings, or a painting evokes a poem that is later written into it. She may dance a poem while wearing a mask that has emerged from a painting. She is a multimedia artist whose approach to a topic includes poetry, painting, theory, dance, recordings, and video. I, de I detect a theme. Her oeuvre focuses on multiple callings, the obsessive muse. Brenda has had solo art shows at York University, Q Space, and Urban Gallery, and she's been in many group art shows. She's been published in a number of literary journals over the years. She has a chapbook, The Luminist Poems, from Lyr Lyrical Miracle, and a book of poetry titled Fury from Guernica Editions this last year, right? They are for sale, of course. You have some here. How much are they? Only $20. And a forthcoming, for, forthcoming novella, Fugue in Green from Quattro Books. You're doing very well, Brenda. Please welcome her to the stage, Brenda Clues. I'm doing all Tidal Fury, uh, so I'm doing um, uh, a Native um, American piece, um, and then I'm doing two Medusa poems, and uh, then two dance poems with sarongs. Is that right, Medusa? And whatever, I think it's five or six poems. At the end, I'm doing some very short poems on writing. So um, this piece, um, I, I read um, this story in Keepers of the Earth um, in the 90s to my children when they were young. And when I was writing Tidal Fury, it just kind of rose up through my unconscious, subconscious or unconscious or whatever. Um, so it's a kind of retelling. And uh, I hope I, I've cited my sources. You can find the story all over the net. Um, it's a beautiful story, um, but, it, but it is told through the narrator of Tidal Fury, who sort of is and isn't me. Um, it's called Tidal Patterns. Once, the tide remained high. Without clams or seaweed, the Timsian went hungry. Raven knew what lay under the blue, glistening robes of water. When he wrapped his blanket of black feathers around his strong shoulders, he flew. Scanning the edges of the ocean, he found her. Tightly, she held the tide line in her hands. She would not release the waters to rhythmically rise and fall or draw back from the beach, leaving washed treasures, clams, seaweed, shells, and shiny stones. Why did the old woman hold the tide line so tightly in her lined, papery hands? Lodged in her house on the edge of the ocean, she gripped the waters in the lifelines on her palms. Who can tell from the mass of mounds and lines on her hands how the old woman bid the edges of the water be still? Inside her sun-bleached house, with closed eyes, she imagined the ocean or saw it with visionary sight. She sat the tide line, her hands, the one interconnected with the other, crying tears of salt. 
raven dropped from the sky, a shadow of black feathers. He sat beside her and groaned, holding his belly, saying he had eaten too many clams. He broke her meditation, and she rose to go and look at the clams. But he pushed her, and she fell, and he poured sand in her eyes, so she was blinded. Pulling the tide line from her, ripping the lifeline from her, he released the ocean, so the tide at last fell. Crazy old woman on the edge of time, time's burden, that weight of life-giving water. So the ocean drew back its mantle of blue robes, and the people feasted. There were bonfires on the beaches and a clam and a festival of clam bakes that lasted days until everyone's bellies were swollen with food. Who was the blind old woman crying on the beach with the torn hands? Raven in raucous joviality, passing from one feasting party to the next, found himself before the old woman who spoke. Raven, heal my eyes so I may see again. Raven, trickster figure, Promethean fire stealer, knew the gods must be bargained with, appeased, so he struck a deal. Old woman of the sea, I will heal you, but you must promise to let the tide line go twice a day so the people may gather food from the beaches. She agreed, so he rinsed the sand out of her eyes. Thus, Raven ensured the lifelines of the people, their continuity. As I walk the desolate beach, strewn with empty clam shells, the detritus of modern civilization, I want to find her, to find out why the withholding but I spin like Tiresias under an unrelenting sun. Why is my hair strewn with black feathers? I see a flare of volcanoes, a red rage of light. On this windless day, how did my eyes fill with sand? My hands bleed as I write. For what do I weep? Thank you. I have a costume to just who. It's my Medusa wig. I did a lot of research, and I ended up with the, with this. I made it. I didn't make the wig, but I. Uh, okay, so um, I am from an African jungle. I was lived 200 miles from the nearest town in mud huts as a child, and as a two-year-old, I was taught mortal fear of snakes because, of course. In Africa, they're extremely poisonous snakes. So I carry this phobia to this day. There are a lot of snakes in Tidal Fury. <laughs> I sort of say, face your fear. You know, there's a lot of creativity in, in, uh, in whatever you, you have a phobia about. Um, so the Medusa showed up in this writing. Um, this is one of the central poems, the Medusa. Can you know the depths of the anguish, monsieur? Deep in the grammar of the self where it unravels, defies linguistic coherency. Being forced to look with unblinking eyes. 
a terror of catatonia, the self-portrait. A work is at once order and its ruin, and these weep for one another. My head unwraps in the mirror like a ribbon or writhing snake. This writing, is it risk-taking? Am I subverting myself in this emotional storm of words? Apollo rising, full of pride, held out the head of the Medusa to this grotesquely uncouth Dionysian power. Nietzsche sees the Medusa as a figure of death between them, says Derrida. She who turns life into art with her gaze, Flesh becomes stone, pigment, pixel, celluloid. The immortalizer who kills us. I weep on an altar of rainbow serpents on shed skin. The coils in my jewel-studded hair cut a mass of deathly serpent eyes. muse. Medusa is my muse and her snakes appear everywhere. Um, on the beach. Um, polished pebbles. And, uh, smooth glass baubles. Tangled fishing wire, waterlogged boots, translucent shells chipped, mollusks and sea urchins, dead cadaverous detritus swollen along the glimmering band of sand. I see her on sea walks. She gazes out to sea. Grief on her face wet from the spray of the rocks that she stands on, and something indefinable, lit from within, but subtle, like sunset spilling out of her eyes. But the coast is empty. I don't know who I am. Me, her, you, or a transfigured god, a Medusa lady, the curls in my hair coiling in the salt spray, an image maker. Blue dancers leap and fall, disappearing bubbles of sea foam. You are the edge of the waves that tip over when the peak cannot hold itself aloft and falls like a dancer letting go of taut tension and plunging or perhaps it is words that fall into froth. We stand on the shore of oceans that encompass the earth. Let me bathe in your words, salt rinsing raw passion, our vision infinite as the skyline. Am I in love with you and who? My unbidden, unbidden holy muse. And um, now I'm going to do some sarong pieces. So I'll move this back again. Uh, this one was quite a bit of thought. Eventually went to Queen Street and got some fabric and took it home and dyed it with permanent inks and sewed it. And uh, I think I'll just tie my hair back for this. Um, so a lot of these poems aren't right together in the book, but they kind of pick, uh, pick up on uh, themes as you go through. Uh, so this is called Dance of the Sarong. Wrapping raw silk around my shoulders, torso, breasts, and head. 
I dance like a slave seeking a freedom that is terrifying. With nothing to constrain you, contain, fetter, way, what would you do? Who would you be? If we could ignore being watched, read, observed, judged about the unceasing gaze of the other, what would we do? Who would we be? How do we keep each other in check? Clipped, chained, trapped. We push elbows against the tight fabric and turn and gyrate and fall our self-imposed prisons. In shades of blue, the sarongs echo the burqa dress code. In societies that contain the energies of women, Binding them. Images shape our dance. Ancient Egyptian mummies. Torture victims. Michelangelo's slaves. Enslavements from without and the ways we enslave ourselves. I dance a life struggles. Twirling, fighting for release along the wall. Private anguish is visible. We are enwrapped in an invisibility that gives us the freedom to fight for inner freedom. When the dance is over, we peel off the sarongs like ribbons of skin and sit in the circle wondering if any of us is closer to who we are. The next one uh, is considerably later in the book. It's called Chthonic, and um, the book actually is um, poetry, prose poetry, prose theory, and it has a, a narrative, so uh, there actually is a development in it. Okay, so this is called Chthonic. <laughs> Soft cotton sarong in wide swaths of orange, plum, cream, and simmering moons becomes a snake with many eyes. I know by the way it winds around my neck while I sway on the dance floor. Serpents of protection, do I hallucinate? Gold snakes cling pour over my swaying arms while I shimmy and gyrate the sensuous rhythms of flute and sitar. I am possessed. The writhing waterfall of coppery snakes stream. I hold earth lightning in my hands like a Minoan snake goddess. I can't stop dancing. A lady of serpents, everywhere they slither and coil, an energy of creativity that persists despite inner dissension, the envy of the other. The face of envy on the dance floor is a mass of dry, dead hair, an austere, thin frame without sensuality or warmth, the cruelty exposed. 
its breath re-inhale the fumes, unable to prevent, incapable of damaging, useless flap of useless motion, rendered impotent, powerless. Today, the dictator died. The despot is deposed. The cries and laughter of freedom rise to the skies. And I wrote that poem the day uh, Pinochet died. It's the dictator of uh, Chile from 1973 to 1990, but it's also the inner dictator. Um, and uh, the last two uh, short pieces, um, I think it's called Engraved, Etched in Stone. The soft slip of flesh etched in stone under the writer's hand and insomnia. When I obsessed about writing the way I do a lover, I stopped sleeping. Now I keep a notebook, its white sheets beside me in the night to write blindly. Words flow between the imaginal and the real. All day, euphoric and tired. Such nights of intense lovemaking. Thank you. Brenda Clues. Mm -hmm. Give me a line. She who turns life into art with her gaze. Yes. Private anguish is visible. Yes. The soft slip of flesh etched in stone. Yes. I dance like a slave seeking the freedom of the terrifying. Yes. I weep on an altar of rainbow serpents. Yes. She held the tide line in her hands. Yes. I had that one. <clears throat> that cadaverous, that ritual swollen. Mm -hmm. My hands bleed as I write. Yes. I weep on an altar of rainbow serpents. Sorry, what was that? I weep on an altar of rainbow serpents. Very good, thanks. Such nice of that. Making. Yes. I dance a life's struggles. Mm -hmm. My hands bleed as I write. Blue glistening robes of water. I'm trying. We're going through my list. And <laughs> everybody said, well, a terror of catatonia. A self-portrait. It's great. She who turns life into art with her stone. Is that it? Gaze. 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 Yeah. Medusa. I know. I went to school with her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that. <laughs> Don't check my birth certificate. <laughs> I think it was salt rinsing, raw passion. It was great. And then the other one was the writhing waterfalls of coppery snakes. Yes. Very good. Another round of applause, please. That was awesome.